LegalizeFreedom.com Why are we here? Where do we come from? Where are we going? From the nature of reality to the future of humanity. Beyond politics, poverty and war. LegalizeFreedom.com Greetings and welcome once again to LegalizeFreedom.com. I'm your host Greg Moffat and my guest today is Tony Wright who joins us to discuss his book, Return to the Brain of Eden, Restoring the Connection Between Neurochemistry and Consciousness. Over a period of a million years, the human brain expanded at an increasingly rapid rate, but suddenly, around 200,000 years ago, this expansion stopped. Modern science has overlooked this in order to maintain the illusion that humans are at the pinnacle of evolution. However, It is extremely significant that the abrupt end to brain expansion explains not only recently uncovered anomalies within the human brain, but also the universal mythic traditions of a lost earthly paradise and of humanity's degeneration from our original state of perpetual wonder and joy. Drawing on more than 20 years of research, Return to the Brain of Eden explores how our modern brains are performing far below their true potential and how we can unlock our higher abilities and return to the euphoria of our distant past. It explains how for millions of years, early forest dwelling humans were primarily consuming the hormone rich sex organs of plants, otherwise known as fruit, which contains a highly complex biochemical cocktail evolved to influence DNA transcription, rapid brain development and elevated neural and pineal gland activity. Recent neurological and psychological studies suggest that the loss of our symbiotic fruit-based diet led to a progressive neurodegenerative condition characterized by aggressive behavior, a fearful perception of the world, and the suppression of higher artistic, mathematical, and spiritual abilities. Return to the Brain of Eden shows how many shamanic and spiritual traditions were developed to counteract our decline and outlines a strategy to reverse our degeneration restore our connection with the plant world and regain the bliss and peace that is the true human condition. Hello and welcome Tony and thank you so much for joining us today on LegalizeFreedom.com. Hi Greg, uh, yeah, uh, good to be here and uh, yeah, looking forward to your, uh, your questions. Now, Tony, today we're going to discuss your forthcoming book um, which you've co-authored with, is it Graham Ginn, am I pronouncing that correctly? Uh, Graham Jinn. Oh, yes, Jinn. Uh, okay. Uh, the book's entitled Return to the Brain of Eden, Restoring the Connection Between Neurochemistry and Consciousness. Um, before we get into that, perhaps you could just tell us a bit about your personal background and how you came to be doing this work in the first place. <laughs> that probably fill a whole interview in itself, but uh, the, the brief version... Um, well, yeah, I mean, I guess like a lot of people curious about, you know, the world we inhabit, what's going on, and... Um, ran into some people who were interested in, I guess, what drives all of that. At least that's what I've come to understand. Uh, Effectively, our state of mind is central to everything we do and the culture and civilization that we manifest. So um, a good 20 years ago or more, um, those were the kind of things that came together. And I I just, you know, my curiosity got the better of me. And um, I started started digging into the literature and started some self-experimentation and really recognized that my interest was to do with what we generally term as consciousness, our state of mind, and how that plays such a all-pervasive role in what we create. And really looking, oh, my interest was, you know, if there's a problem with, with what we're doing as a species, is that the place to look? And obviously being rapidly aware that many other people had asked these questions. In fact, the the origins of the kind of religious and spiritual traditions were all asking similar questions. So I really just revisiting that, but trying to look at it perhaps from a, a more Western or rational perspective and, and, and looking for a way of understanding it that perhaps was more more suited to modern language, I guess, and perhaps my own my own limits in understanding. 
Now, the starting point for all this, generally speaking, is that sometime in the distant past in human history, there was a golden age. And then at some point after that, there was a fall, fall from grace. This ties in with what most people will be familiar with is the story of the Garden of Eden. And these two themes, um, that of a golden age and also of a fall, these are universal themes. Yes, very much. Uh, well, well, yes, I mean, that, that that's a central part of, of, of what's covered in the book and my, my sort of interest. And I was really looking to try and tie that together with the the increasing awareness. Uh, well, hardly new. In fact, people, people have been, you know, incredibly intelligent, creative people have been commenting on the human condition uh, and our apparent insanity for an awful long time. So just, just really looking, I, I was just interested to know whether there was a connection there. Um, and obviously, it, oh, it struck me quite early on that, um, you know, looking for perhaps a new perspective or looking for clues, it would be sensible to get a good handle on our origins. Was there anything in our origins that might make sense of all this? And you, you mentioned the Garden of Eden story, which, of course, a classic, um, a classic version of, of these universal ideas, myths, beliefs and so on. Um, and, and, and yes, really looking to see if that correlated with what I might call the the Western tradition or the modern scientific tradition was was there a twin track here? Were, were these stories telling us something similar, and could that be useful in, in unraveling what I felt was, if not a mystery to our ancestors, certainly a mystery to us now, where the, the general view seems to be that we're progressing and advancing, of course not with everybody, um, and that you know our technology is somehow going to save us from 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 the mess we're making, and, and just looking really to I guess put the pieces together in a different way, create a new context. So, so yes, um, that was a big part of it. Origins, the ancient traditions, the ancient mythology, and looking for correlations with modern science and, and again, uh, investigations into our origins. So that, that was a very big chunk of it. But one of the issues in all this is is the tale of human evolution, because we have a Lots of people have got different ideas about this. Of course, we know the whole evolution versus creationism debate. But if we take the mainline modern Western scientific view of evolution, that's quite set now, quite established since the days of Darwin. And even though there's challenges uh, to this coming from all sorts of angles, it's still the mainstream view. And if that is accepted as such, it becomes difficult to do the sort of analysis that you're doing because you have to kind of start to rewrite that story. Yeah, I, I mean, it, it, it is difficult to, I think, challenge um, existing ideas. There's obviously plenty of people aware of that and plenty of books written about it. But I'd like to think, and time will tell, that it, I'm not so much challenging. Well, the way I tend to frame it is, you know, I, I think the data, the information, the sort of research that's been done is excellent. I'm really challenging the interpretation and how the pieces are fitted together and in in tandem with that, and particularly when we get to the outcome of this, and, and the outcome being that I, you know, I think the development of our neural system, the development development of our brain, has been compromised in such a way that we actually find it difficult to see that anymore. Um, weaving that into the mix as well, so actually questioning the equipment that we use to analyze ourselves. You know, we 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 we're doing all this science, um, asking all sorts of questions, coming up with answers presuming generally that the equipment we use to do that that we're all obliged to use and we know it's you know the, the evidence that our neural system our brain is is central in this is, is extremely compelling we tend to presume that works okay um and then we ask questions how does it work where does it come from and all the other stuff so really i've, I've just been trying to reframe the material rather than challenge the the, the the data i think particularly the data on our origins being forest dwelling arboreal um and then um all the associated information without the sort of the the, the botany and the, the the pharmacology of the tropical forest all this stuff i think the data is excellent all i'm really saying is look can we rearrange this and does it produce a more coherent result uh, does it make more sense of our origins and also when you you talk about the sort of perhaps let's frame it diplomatically the debate between the creation stories and the the Western science traditions, um, are they perhaps drawing on the same kind of experiences? But is it back to an interpretation problem, bearing in mind that, you know, as I say, we're all stuck with using this equipment. If it works, if we're able to 
um, analyze the information, come up with appropriate conclusions, fine. If there's a glitch there, if there's a problem in the very equipment we're using, that needs to be looked at, even if it's just to dismiss that, even if it's to give ourselves a clean bill of health and we move on. I'm just saying, look, we've never really checked this out. Certainly Western science has never asked serious questions about our uh, the functionality of our neural system, our very ability to do science, our very ability to come up with coherent solutions. So kind of throwing those things into the mix, but not necessarily challenging the data. And as I say, I draw a lot on the data. I, I think the data generally is excellent. It's the interpretation and the equipment we use for the interpretation is, you know, it's a kind of tight loop. It's an interesting loop. We, we I think it's necessary to look at the equipment as well as the data before we jump to conclusions. In terms of the brain, human brain, what appears to have happened, uh, you assert, is that there's basically been a deintegration of the left and right hemispheres. And most people will be familiar with, you know, left brain, right brain thinking and behavior. And some people are lean more in one direction than the other. But essentially what's happened is that the left half of the brain has now become dominant. And that's manifests itself in how what we see in human society globally. But also as a result of this long process that you detail, not only is the left dominant, but it's become quite severely damaged or it's it's impaired in some way. And at the right is less so, but also it's untapped because it is not dominant. And there's a lot of potential there um, that could be used actually to reintegrate the brain if we could just tap into that. Yes, I mean, uh, I, I certainly draw on those classic left-right traditions and uh, the awful lot of data that's been generated, particularly in the last 40, 50 years and so on. Um, uh, I, and, and the, you know, it's come in for quite a lot of scrutiny and there's, there's some dismissal of the very simplistic interpretations. And yet behind that, there's still some excellent data that highlights the what's often portrayed as specialized function between the hemispheres um, and certainly the the dominance of speech and conceptual thinking um, and, and our general sense of being seems to be very much currently at least the domain of the left hemisphere. It could be argued that uh, a, a lot of our emotional capacity and uh, other abilities, you, you might call them right hemisphere dominant, in other words, that's where we draw on to, to, to experience those things. But generally, um, yes, you know, in essence, I think that that would be that would be accurate. And what I'm proposing, um, not just based on the, the left right literature, well, I certainly draw on it, but I'm really looking at this wider context, the origins of the biochemistry and the development of, of our brain and so on, that um, rather than saying the left hemisphere is damaged, although I do at times kind of stated like that it's it's more really that um our neural system as a whole has degenerated or probably more accurately I, i'd say revert to a more primitive type um and simply that one side because, because they were always slightly different archaically in the distant past they've reacted or responded to this changing environment which we'll get into i guess in a bit um, differently or asymmetrically, one side has is, is, is become more primitive more quickly than the other side. It just happens to be the left hemisphere. And because it's in time, again, for reasons that we can, we can hopefully get to, become perceptually dominant, at least, our, as I say, our day-to-day -day sense of self is more dominated by the left hemisphere than the right. Yes, there is some variation, but generally, if you're using speech the way I am now, your left hemisphere dominant and there aren't really any exceptions to that i mean again in the in the, in the sort of um more general interpretation of this people talk about being more right hemisphere and so on actually i, I don't think that really exists perhaps very exceptionally it's just degrees of left hemisphere dominance um and if that is the case if there's the remotest possibility that rather than specialized adaptation as is generally portrayed if in fact we're subject to a neural system that has been degenerating and the side that's in the worst shape has taken charge, we really need to check that out. It should be easy to check out. I mean, it's a pretty pretty extreme claim, a pretty grand claim. And it should be quite easy to look at the date and go, no, it's absolutely crazy idea. Our neural system works. Um, so yeah, absolutely. That's, that, that's what I'm proposing is the kind of conundrum in this whole, uh, our ability to even ask questions, to come up with, with interpretations of data. Is our neural system working well? 
I'm proposing one half of our neural system has reverted. It's much more primitive in its functionality and its ability to perceive reality, uh, its cognitive function. Uh, it's lost a lot of what we call, I mean, remember, these are all labels, emotional capacity and so on and so forth. And yet that's what's running the show. If that is the case, then everything is is up for questioning. Um, if it's not the case, if our left hemisphere is highly specialized, highly adapted, absolutely fine. I just want to bring this to the table and say, look, we're using our left hemisphere to ask these questions, assess the data. And a bit like as, as if humanity were a singular patient, a singular person, if there was the remotest possibility that myself or yourself or anybody else had a form of dementia or any other kind of mental ill health, self-assessment immediately is suspect. So giving ourselves a clean bill of health because we think everything's okay isn't going to wash. We've got to look at the relatively objective data. And that's all I'm trying to do is like, well, let's look at this data. Let's not presume we're functional. Is there a possibility on neural systems in trouble, particularly the left side of our brain? If that were the case, there'd be a massive evidence. And if it's not, there'd be little or no evidence. That's the kind of question I, as I say, I'm trying to draw attention to. This might be a right-brained way of thinking about this, but for me personally, for all my life, from the, the age when I could actually think about what was the world around me and what was happening, there's been no question that there is some kind of problem with our way of thinking, our interpretation of reality. Because I see people, world leaders, military people, corporate CEOs, occasionally would meet people like that. And they, my senses tell me, when I say that, I mean everything beyond my five senses tell me that th these people are almost a different species. They're not, probably. <laughs> but how they behave, it's just their way of thinking is alien. We only have to turn on the 10 o'clock news to see that there is a problem. Yes, I mean, uh, I'd completely agree with you, although um, neither myself or, or, or yourself are the first to, to, to recognize this. It's right back through recorded history, as far back as that goes, there seem to be people um, or a good percentage of society saying exactly that. Uh, there's hardly anything new in in talk of human behavior being suspect to perhaps um, clinically insane. And I mean, you've probably noticed this yourself in the last five, 10 years, the the term sociopath and psychopath are, are bandied around much more widely than they were and generally aimed at this the, the sort of hierarchical structures we, we our, our societies uh, have had in place for a long time. And actually, I think they're accurate, although back to your, your point, I, I don't think this is... Um, uh, a, a condition that affects a minority of people. I think it's universal. I think it's species wide. However, there are a number of variables um, that lead to a spectrum of symptoms, shall we say. And some people are much more afflicted than others. And intriguingly, the, the, the correlation between specific symptoms and the depth or the, the degree of the condition seem to relate quite well. So, for example, the more afflicted you are with this condition, um, the more there's an underlying fear and a need for control, hand in hand with perhaps less ability to perceive reality, less cognitive function. So you end up, in principle at least, with an explanation for why some of the least functional people uh, have a desire to end up in control, and they usually do. Um, so it's really, in part, a diagnosis for this this hierarchy of madness that, that we seem to be... Uh, subject to for the last several thousand years at least and perhaps it's getting worse and in tandem with that um, because hormones play a big part in this theory and again hopefully we'll get to that um, there's a gender issue here as well um, and while I, I want to reiterate that this is species-wide and it afflicts everybody at least my proposal that, that's what I'm proposing um, males because testosterone plays a key role in this are more afflicted than females. Um, what it what it doesn't mean is that um, males exclusively exhibit these traits and 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 females don't. But I would expect males to exhibit a more extreme spectrum of symptoms. So you'll end up with um, the worst end of this neurological retardation, as I call it, the the complete lack of 
um, empathy, um, the, the complete lack of being able to perceive reality, a complete form of dementia, I guess. Males tend to exhibit that in its most extreme form, hand in hand with this underlying fear that, of course, is a classic symptom of mental ill health. So a great deal of fear, often great efforts to hide it subjectively and from every, everybody else, driving this need to be in control. So it's, it's, it's really in part an explanation for these social and societal structures that we have. But rather than saying that they're, they're the product of some kind of specialist adaptation, it's actually a symptom of neural Ill, you know neural damage neural retardation um quite challenging stuff but actually and again going back to what you said it immediately resonates with a lot of people you know big percentage of people are already aware there's a serious problem with this structure we have um and yes we you know we tend to get angry and blame people but really if this is just a neurological condition that we're all subject to but some worse than others then we can start looking at perhaps what is the cause of this and how do we treat it and take the blame away. Well, let's talk about the process underlying this because your book points back to, um, in our early development, basically a change in environment and specifically diet, which is key. <clears throat> well, it's uh, it, 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 there are you know several key pieces to this and it takes a little while to piece them together. Um, so yes, I mean back to the uh, my early interest in this, and again, as, as as I mentioned, it struck me that our our origins, what were our origins exactly? How did we evolve in the way we did? Um, and a lot of the classic questions, particularly around our exceedingly or our unusually large brain, at least in regard to our body size and so on, and of course a lot of orthodox interest in that, a lot of orthodox data. But also these ancient traditions that seem to talk about um, our origins having something to do with uh, the forests. We were naked, so it must have been warm. And some traditions are even quite explicit in the talk of fruit and trees playing a role in this. I guess the, the Genesis story being being the best example of that, but not the only example. Um, so I, I really just wanted to look at, at uh, the, all the data on our origins, not just the, the modern data, and look for anything unusual. And what struck me, and I have a little bit of a background in plant plant sciences, was that actually there was something incredibly unusual in our origins, if, 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 um, if the data is correct. It wasn't just that we lived in the forests and we were some form of um, primate or ape, but we actually had a, a relationship with the forest that is virtually unique in the whole of evolutionary history. And this, you know, immediately jumped out at me. So, oh, this is fascinating. And it was, in fact, the relationship we had with the flowering plants, the trees in the forest, as seed disseminators. And this is generally classed as a symbiotic relationship. Um, the symbiotic relationships are very common and, uh, and they're receiving more attention as time goes by. We've been so focused on competition and survival of the fittest and all this kind of stuff. But actually, symbiotic relationships are incredibly prevalent and important in, in evolutionary history. And what struck me about this particular relationship was that humans and our distant ancestors and their relatives generally were forming relationships with the flowering plants in, a, in, a, in an extremely unique way. And in particular, with the sex organs of the plants. Okay, I'm gonna say that again, the sex organs of the plants. We formed this relationship with the sex organs of the plant. We were ingesting the sex organs of the plants and disseminating the, the plant seeds. Now, today we call it fruit and we kind of think, okay, it's something to do with diet, it's something we can eat. But actually fruit is the swollen sex organ of a whole other kingdom. So you think about that for a minute and it, it, it is worth just pondering on it for a while, forming this relationship with the, the sex organs of a whole other kingdom, ingesting them on a daily basis over evolutionary time, time scales. And of course, the sex organs of any species, plants included, are pretty bizarre. They're full of all sorts of um, complex chemical compounds and hormonally active chemicals. And this is where we're moving towards what I consider to be the unique element of this. So we were ingesting material that was rich in hormonally active compounds day in, day out, 24-7 for millions of years. And of course, the only place you can have a relationship like this that's going to have a significant evolutionary impact is where? Well, not just the tropical forest, but actually the non-seasonal tropical forest. That's the only place you can get fruit 24-7 for incredibly long periods. 
So that was that jumped out as an incredibly unique factor. And of course, it's well accepted. Nobody would really argue with that as far as I'm aware. I just think the importance had been overlooked. It, again, because we grow up, you mentioned the word diet, we kind of have this idea of food and diet being somehow separate. We needed to fuel ourselves and so on. But in this particular case, we formed a relationship with something that was so rich in biochemistry of an unusual nature that it had the capacity to affect our own hormone regime, the way our own hormones work. And we'll get, I guess, to the next bit, but that is important in terms of how how our DNA is read and how that affects our development and particularly things like the development of our brain, the function of our brain. But it was this, anyway, back to the key point, it was back to this symbiotic relationship with the flowering plants and specifically this relationship with their sex organs. So I, I know I've said that several times, but it really needs emphasizing. Well, there's a lot of talk these days in particular about um, uh, paleo diet and whether you subscribe to that as being you know, authentic or you know, good for us as human beings. Um, it's clear that a lot of what we're eating, I'm not just talking about you know, modern junk food, but a lot of what we've been eating for the past several thousand years has certainly been quite different to what we did for the huge span of time, as far as we can tell, prior to that. Yes, yes. Well, that, that is very key. And again, a lot of points to address in that potentially. Um, but certainly for the, the biggest part of our evolution, again, forest dwelling, this relationship going on with the sex organs of plants and um, this quite unusual emergence of very, very large neural systems, very, very large brains, particularly an expansion of the neocortex and what appears to be hand in hand with hand in hand with this an extending juvenile window, a longer period before reaching sexual maturity, the kind of period you need to build a big brain like this. Um, and that seems to be the biggest chunk of our evolutionary history. Now, when we get to what happened next, the kind of standard idea is we couldn't wait to get out of the forest and get into all these relatively hostile environments. And for various reasons, whether it was the need for intelligence or hunting meat on the savannas or, you know, lots of competing theories. Um, but there's a presumption that whenever we find evidence of, of, of humans or our ancestors living outside the forest, that that's representative of any given lineage, like the, ho the whole collection of whatever species it was. And again, we're working with arbitrary terminology here, um, but nevertheless, we'll stick with that. So a particular lineage all decided one day to leave the forest and go hunting on the savanna. And of course, I'm simplifying that greatly. What's never really questioned is evidence of human ancestors living outside the forest. Was that wholly representative or were these just refugees that found themselves outside the forest for whatever reason? And because they already had a relatively large and intelligent brain, they could survive for at least a period. Um, that's something that I don't think has been addressed. And when you factor that in, it opens up the, the door to at least the possibility Remember, this is a theory that certainly needs more scrutiny, needs more testing, but it opens up the door to the possibility that our ancestral lineages stayed in the forest much longer than we currently think. Yes, there were refugees. Yes, there were people ending up outside the forest, surviving, speciating and, and doing reasonably well from a classic Darwinian perspective. But was the formula, was this symbiotic relationship if it was a, if it was absolutely essential for the expansion of our brain and a, a kind of new kind of brain with different functions, was that still in place? Well, absolutely not. You end up in environments where you have to eat what what are kind of called fallback foods, or you end up developing completely new approaches, hunting, the invention of fire, all these kind of things that we've we've been told were important in our evolution. Well, were these just survival strategies, and did they support the expansion and development of this? incredibly unique piece of equipment between our ears and remember large brains for a large animal like herself virtually absent in the whole of the fossil record so again i'm saying there was something unique going on we know many many species live in all these relatively hostile environments and generally they don't produce phenomenally large and incredibly intelligent neural systems and yet the forest and forgive the pun but it's like they grow on trees Re reasonably common particularly in the primate lineage and the common factor there seems to be this relationship with fruit. And yet it's had very little attention, even though fruit, as I say, well, it's not fruit. It's this hormonally active sex organ of another species. So really, I'm, I'm, what I'm trying to say is, have we tried to make the data fit 
our expectations based on this idea of survival of the fittest and so on, um, when in fact there's already a mechanism in place that would completely change the way our DNA is read and completely change the way our hormones work and how that must have impacted on the length of our developmental windows and in turn how long our brain gets to develop. And on top of that, the kind of the biochemistry that our brain needs to to run on. So so really, I'm not saying anything new here. I'm just saying let's look at the data in a different way. Let's look at these factors. Let's look for anything unusual. Well, we've got something unusual. Could that have been a factor? And so far, you know, the reaction is is very promising. A lot of people are sort of saying, well, yeah, you know, we know about this, and yet we've never really put these pieces together in this way. Now, if, um, as you mentioned a few moments ago, certain sections of the human species found themselves, for whatever reason, outside of the forest, had to adapt, survive, find new ways, new modes, new strategies for survival. They wouldn't necessarily, if, if that new lifestyle and amended diet and great, more challenging environment was less optimal for their development, and over time they did suffer you know, physically or mentally, the forest dwellers that were still there they obviously didn't go on to become dominant. We can see that now where we are stand in human development today. So at some point, I mean, what environmentally happened? It was some sort of climate events perhaps that resulted in more and more humans having to leave the forest and the degradation of the forest over time. It would stand to reason if the forest was the optimal environment that those humans would would stay dominant, you know, on top of the tree, so to speak. Yes, uh, and, and, and that's a really good point. Um, well, w- what I'd say is that uh, just just for the moment, accepting the possibility that this symbiotic relationship, the, the non-seasonal tropical forests were, this, were the catalyst for this, these very unusual traits, this expanding large brain with these very unusual characteristics, um, profound sort of levels of cognitive function, highly intelligent um, different abilities, self-awareness, empathy, all this kind of stuff. If that if that was a function, if that was a product of this symbiotic relationship, then what I'd expect, or what what certainly could fit very well, is yes, you get you get periods of forest contraction where various lineages might get isolated, and then you end up, as as you say, survival approaches um, where this optimal formula is gone, but species clearly survive. But this may have gone on a lot longer than we thought. However, tropical forests, while they can be stable perhaps for millions of years, they are the Achilles heel in this theory. Um, if, your, if your neural development, neural function is dependent on the mature uh, and combined products of a particular kind of forest, if it ever does go completely, then you're going to be in trouble. So what I'm, what I'm suggesting is that um, humans, and I'm not saying this from a, a kind of arrogant perspective but it looks to me like humans may have been one of the last uh, species in this kind of relationship to survive um, until the forest uh, did finally um, pretty much disappear in in one of these great climatic dryings which we know or at least the evidence suggests do occur from time to time and even tropical forests can can succumb and it looks like the African forests were perhaps a little bit more susceptible than, than some of the other tropical forests and there certainly seems to be windows of drying including the kind of window that might correlate, looks like it could correlate, with the end of the rapid expansion of our neural system. And a lot, you know, there's a lot of interest and still a lot of debate on why our neural system, why our brain expanded, not only to the size it did, but the speed it expanded and the fact it was the expansion was accelerating um, over the last couple of million years. It was was on an accelerating curve and it's you know it's very expensive to build very expensive to run and clearly many many species well the vast vast majority of species have never required a very large brain to survive it's not necessarily or probably not about survival at all so you've got this kind of weird curve going on this accelerating expansion and then it stalls and that to me is equally interesting and in fact if anything it's been shrinking ever since for approximately 200,000 years, give or take. I mean, you know, we're still relying on fossil evidence. More fossils may emerge, but let's say approximately 200,000 years was the end of this rapid expansion phase. So I was looking at that as a smoking gun. It's like, well, what could correlate with that? Was there a drying round about that time? And it looks like it does fit. It looks like there could have been a final and significant drying. 
and any species, any of the species still locked into this symbiotic relationship, that would be the last time that would have would have been adding to this kind of expansion formula. And I suspect, as I say, humans may have been one of the last and perhaps the only species that were still locked into that non-seasonal tropical forests. Remember, we've got some unusual traits. We, you know, we're naked. You take your clothes off and you know you're a tropical animal if you go outside anywhere other than the tropics. You know, the, the temperature range of sort of 25 to 35 is perfect for us. And, and we're very inefficient in, in our water use. We sweat a lot. We're clearly not savannah adapted in the way some people think. But put us in the tropical forests where the fruit falls off the trees and there's no big predators, ideal, absolutely ideal. However, if that goes, if that forest goes and our, again, back to the idea of symbiosis, symbiotic relationships effectively mean not a human and a plant. You're looking at a co-joined organism effectively. So it's like a part of our organism disappears in fact, produ producing all the hormones necessary for our brain development and function and all the biochemistry. If that goes, then, of course, our neural system is going to stop expanding and it's going to not it's going to work radically differently. We're losing the most complex, most complex molecular environment that we currently know of, which is the tropical forests. Well, the tropical trees are pumping all this chemical know how into their own sex organs for the development of their own subsequent generations and also to attract seed disseminators forming these symbiotic relationships so all this know-how going into these packages of highly edible treats you know it's it is a classic free lunch um which you, you, you tend not to get in nature but this is like you know the, the trees were their their sex organs were expanding they were competing with each other for business um basically um trying to tempt various species in order to disseminate seeds once that goes, once that incredibly complex formula goes, no way can a system as complex as our neural system work the same. Now, did it work differently and was it fine? Did we adapt? Or have we, in fact, lost the essential biochemistry and developmental environment needed for it to develop and work at all? There's been some writing, highly entertaining and interesting, if not probably accurate, about our hairlessness, um, the size of our um, skulls and re in relation to uh, size of female pelvis, um, the fact that we seem to be, you know, ill adapted in so many ways for living on this planet that basically we're not from this planet. That's one of the <laughs> popular theories. But I suppose looking at it with your data in mind, it's a case of we're ill adapted for life, the environment on this planet as it is right now. And of course, if you then factor in uh, impaired cognitive function, well, that, that also changes everything in terms of how we relate to the environment, how we think about things. Well, well, yes. And, you know, I highlight cognitive function simply because it's it's quite an emotive area. But I, I'd say it's actually beyond that, even even how we define important cognitive function or how we define advanced behavior and so on. I, I'm, I'm really talking about a very perception of who and what we are. Uh, that inevitably must have changed. You know, the the evidence that the evidence for an incredibly tight correlation between n neural structure generally, including, you know, subcellular structure and the neurochemistry, tiny changes, you know, minuscule brain damage is as small as a pinprick or changes in the development and environment um injury as an adult all of these things we know can have a massive impact on our sense of who we are and our behavior and so on so what i'm really saying is here that it looks like you know uh, the origins of our neural system was hothoused quite literally in in these well in in the most complex molecular ecology we know and we were we had this very incredibly unique relationship with the 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 species that produced this molecular ecology that the flowering plants way way more complex than mammals they produce way more chemistry than we could ever dream of um if that all goes then of course it must have had a massive massive impact not just on the development and our cognitive function but a very sense of who and what we are and that's where i think it's 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 also incredibly fascinating that prior to the advent of of what we tend to kind of talk about is modern western science which i think has obviously come up with fantastic data but prior to that our kind of own only natural history a source of where we came from were these these traditions and aside from alluding to possible tropical origins as, as i've already covered the sort of being naked eating fruit you know it, it fits quite well in addition to that they all seem to talk 
about some kind of degeneration, the fall of grace you, you talked about. And, in, and, and they come up with what we call techniques and practices, often shrouded in all sorts of mysterious language. And, and uh, you know, uh, we, we've come to a point where it's even difficult to even challenge these ideas or, or talk about them in a, in a more literal way. But what I'm interested in is can some of these traditions shed light on, on where we are now? And if you strip away the belief in dogma, were these approaches, were these techniques and practices, were they really treatments for what we call a neurological condition in today's language? Particularly as they seem to fall into three general camps. They, they talk about, um, uh, they certainly talk about natural diet. And one of the, th one of the things I'm trying to do currently is, is, is change our perception of diet. And it's, it's really basic engineering. It's, it's the design, construction and fueling of the most advanced piece of kit we know. You know, on a scale of complexity, well, we, we, we barely begun to comprehend how complex our neural system is. So basic design, basic construction, basic fueling, that's embedded in the ancient traditions. They, they talk about natural diet. They also talk about techniques that seem to fall into the camp of mm, inhibiting the input of the left hemisphere, um, not talking, you know, anything to inhibit speech, anything to get out of the rational mind, the chattering mind. Um, and then techniques that seem to engage the right hemisphere, including, of course, the very judicious use of neurochemical analogs. Um, and all these things are seen separately now. I think it's a, it's, a, it's a kind of function of the fact that we're now forced to use our left hemisphere to try and figure out who we are and what's gone wrong. So that, that's where I say there's a, there's a weird loop in this. Um, but it's hardly surprising that if our if our neural system evolved as a symbiotic organ, it's effectively a plant-animal hybrid, in the most complex molecular environment we, we know, you know, and the date is very good on that, and then you strip all that away, and by definition at some level it's going to be chronically neurochemically deficient. It cannot possibly work. It's a bit like it's a bit like taking the fuel out of um a spaceship and and putting in you know some coal or something and say yeah it's going to work the same because it's fuel no no it, it highly specialized fuel it needs to run on therefore not surprising we have this whole array of techniques as i say i would call them treatments trying to access this this latent function trying to get it working in all sorts of ways and of course when people do get glimpses they don't talk about oh yeah that was a little bit better they talk about well, they're often dumbfounded, but they talk about superlatives phenomenally beyond belief better. And these things seem to be locked away and they're clearly not part of a normal function. Otherwise, we'd, be function we, we'd experience them on a day-to-day -day basis. Well, they, these are pretty unusual experiences, yet accounts of them are littered throughout human history and people still experience them today. And they seem to generally correlate with something that takes us out of our normal rational state of mind and yet that's the kind of state of mind that's seen as most specialized and most advanced by some people at least. Now, do we have it back to front? Is it is it the rational mind giving itself a clean bill of health and saying, yes, I'm highly specialized, highly adapted, and that other state of, of mind is something primitive or we don't understand? Do we have it back to front? On that bigger point, I think you're absolutely right that we do. But the fragmented thinking that you were mentioning, I think that is a symptom of what you're talking about and also a source of tremendous problems. We see it in the classical divide, for example, between science and spirituality, things that were at one time not separate, but now very much so. And I think that's gradually changing, but there could be other reasons for that. And I think that that's, we look at things in this compartmentalized way, whereas holistic thinking, perhaps how we would have thought about things in the past, gives us a much clearer picture of how things are. And I think we can see it, the source of a lot of our problems globally due to um, short-term thinking, but also, as I say, fragmented thinking. It's almost like our brains are the disk drive on our computer. You know, every now and again, you need to do a defrag um, to get it back up to you know, full operating speed. <clears throat> well, yes. In fact, I'd say it's a lot worse than that. And, and we, we've a lot of us have grown up with the term reductionism reductionist thinking um and how that in itself is some kind of specialized function and it's easy to forget of course these are all arbitrary terms and all the disciplines that that western science is made up of again they're all invented terms there isn't any such thing really there's there's a singular existence um and i don't mean that in a kind of spiritual sense you know i'm talking about that in basic ecology or basic cosmology there is no real separation and of course people have been talking about this forever and it's also accepted 
in certain quarters of scientific thinking. But nevertheless, we have this reductionist approach and it's seen as somehow to be a valuable tool. And yes, then there's some kind of allusion to the fact that we don't think holistically enough. However, if, if you if you ask some simple questions, is it possible that reductionist thinking is a symptom of neurological dysfunction? Then it puts a wholly different spin on it. Um, it, it it's, it's not it's not that we need to break these things up to understand them. It's because our it's because our rational left hemisphere is just too damn stupid to see the whole picture. It hasn't the capacity anymore. And that's actually in the data. It basically the left hemisphere is unable to do context, is unable to do holistic thinking. Now, is that a specialized trait or is that, you know, is that a symptom of its dysfunction? That's, again, one of the questions I want to bring to the table in a more clear way with this wider context. You know, this this loss of this phenomenally complex neurochemistry, this the loss of all these elements that must have affected the development of a brain, et cetera, et cetera. Put them all on the table, shuffle them around a bit and then start to ask different questions. So, yeah, is reductionist thinking a symptom of neurological dysfunction? Of course, my proposal is yes, absolutely exactly what I'd expect. You know, we 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 cannot perceive the whole picture anymore. It's it's like we're using, you know, using your your computer analogy. We're, we're trying to use a, a 30 year old early computer to watch high definition TV. Well, it just doesn't have the function. It cannot do it. It's not being bloody minded. It's not saying I'm not going to do it like that. Uh, and yet it kind of spins a story for itself. And this is something the left hemisphere is known to do. It, it, it it's perpetually confabulates. It invents stories to cover its own backside all the time. Um, so it invents a story. Yes, highly specialized skills. Reductionism is a specialized approach. Reductionist thinking is necessary to, to make sense of all this. Well, perhaps. But then if you look at savant skills and abilities and prodigious genius abilities, and they all generally seem to be something to do with the left hemisphere we don't necessarily fully understand them but there are certainly individuals capable of juggling phenomenal amounts of information without any problem whatsoever so clearly we have that capacity somewhere and yet we're dominated by this fragmented thinking so what on earth is going on there specialized abilities uh, you know I, in in the talks i do i say it's more like spe- special needs to be honest yes and you raise the issue that perhaps the peak experiences or peak abilities for example of some of the individuals you just mentioned, that that is that that's treated as anomalous. That mm-hmm. and in, in some cases there's something wrong here. And that, you know, I've known a couple of autistic people, and that they did in, have some issues with functioning with the rest of society. But that's that can also say something about the rest of society. But I think that uh, in things like telepathy, for example, and remote viewing, instead of these, I and mean, these are not taken seriously at all, really, by the scientific mainstream. But in those abilities that some people clearly have, we see a glimpse of the higher brain function that perhaps we have lost. That's not something that, you know, these people are not freaks of some sort. It's just that there's something, some signal still getting through. And that this perhaps in the past, the very distant past, these sort of abilities would have been absolutely normal. Yes, well, I'd probably take a middle ground there somewhere and, you know, uh, and being just being aware of how I present this, um, I, I, I'd say for the most part, or pretty universally, actually, I, I, I'd say there haven't been any what we might term today as fully functional humans around for a very long time. What I, what I think we've, we've started to see in, in this process of degeneration is if one side of the if one side of our neocortex has been degenerating more quickly than the other, and yet paradoxically, particularly in recent times, the last five ten thousand years has perceptually at least taken charge. And again, there's reasons for that if we can get into it with this time. Um, what I think you end up with then is is the weaker of the two hemispheres paradoxically in charge, and as the degeneration proceeds and if it perhaps even accelerates its very ability to stay in charge can become compromised as well. Um, So you can end up with situations either with with structural and very tangible damage where people have had accidents and the damage has clearly been left hemisphere. Sometimes the the evidence isn't clear, um, but where where you get, using the terms you used, bigger holes punched in our normal perception. So it's still perceptually dominant, but there's more access to this very latent function. And it's, you know, I don't even think that's fully fired up, but it's very impressive compared to our normal function. So, yes, I think what you get is potentially um, 
more dysfunction in our left hemisphere paradoxically can release function in the right hemisphere because it just isn't able to control everything quite so well anymore. Um, and that's why I think you can get this apparent contradiction with individuals who display inabilities in certain areas of social function. And of course, it does ask questions about what we consider normal. But beyond that, I think there probably is, or certainly in, in a lot of cases, there is more dysfunction in some ways. The left hemisphere is more dysfunctional, but that's the very mechanism that's allowing more access to the latent abilities that that yes absolutely i think were normal for everybody all the time um but i certainly don't think they represent full function um i think they're just glimpses they just give us a a hint of of what's gone missing uh, you know it, it, it's a challenging idea but i i suspect a lot of what we consider to be normal is absolutely near the bottom of total dysfunction and then these glimpses there there are you know some of the savant and genius abilities they're not twice as good they're not five times as good people used to talk about compensation and so on they're off the scale better absolutely off the scale better now if, if that's if that's only partial glimpses and partial function and remember very few of these individuals have all this missing biochemistry there so it, it's unlikely that it's going to be full function it, to me it's 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 an exciting possibility that well, perhaps these ancient traditions were more accurate than we we care to imagine. They they don't talk about a few people becoming dysfunctional and aggressive. It's generally implied that it's species wide, and it's been a very long period of degeneration or or step after step of degeneration. So it's it's not a minor condition. It's a very very severe condition. I I would suggest it's severe as taking our normal reference points, and I know they're. P- pretty suspect when you look again at the hierarchy of social structures but nevertheless let's let's you know let's take our normal function then we look uh, at someone who's got a, a pretty serious form of dementia i think that's at least the difference between where we are now and where our ancestors were it's quite harsh but i you know that that's what i'm putting on the table that concludes part one of this interview be sure to tune in next time for part two If you enjoy the show, please check out the website, that's legalisefreedom.com, legalise-freedom.com, where you'll find an archive of programmes offering alternative views on a wide range of topics, including world affairs, politics and economics, science and technology, religion and spirituality, conspiracy and alternative history. You can also browse and buy a range of books and DVDs from our guests, and if you're feeling generous, make a donation to help keep the site up and running. Until next time, I'm Greg Moffat, and you've been listening to LegalizeFreedom.com.